Hi, we're Jared and Amanda with After Homeschool, where we help homeschoolers learn about career fields in STEM and beyond. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of After Homeschool. Um, today, we have a, a nice interview lined up with Seth Price. Uh, Amanda and I, we haven't actually met Seth Price, but he is uh, he went to the same school that we did in Socorro, New Mexico, New Mexico Tech. And uh don't know a whole lot about his background, but just looking over his LinkedIn profile, looks like he's into some really interesting stuff. So, um, Seth, uh, thank you for joining us, and welcome. Thank you. So, Seth, um, you know, Kind of just tell us maybe what you do now, and then, um, um, and then you can just kind of walk uh, walk how you got to where you are, and uh, what kind of led you on the path that you're on. Sure. Okay. Well, um, I am a my formal title is laboratory associate in the chemical engineering department at New Mexico Tech, and so I teach a couple of the labs there and maintain all the lab equipment and facilities for that that department. And uh, outside of that, I do tutoring for um, high school math and science at uh, Magdalena Public Schools, which is a little ways outside of the college there. And um, I also do some freelancing, uh, some technical writing and technical editing. And I also run a small business uh, that we're on a little bit of a hiatus here with the, with the virus. But um, I take people out storm chasing once a year. Oh wow, that's exciting! Yeah. <laughs> so how did you get into storm chasing? Well, I'd always been interested in storm chasing. Um, it, believe it or not, uh, there was a TV special when I was about four years old that I watched. You know, it was a rainy day; it wasn't much to do outside, so I watched it and uh, ended up doing a lot of. Uh, just being interested in meteorology and, and severe weather in particular. And it wasn't until I was part of the way through uh, my undergraduate degree, my first undergraduate degree, that I got back into it and um, just um, just was watching a thunderstorm come in and uh, to Blacksburg, Virginia, which is where Virginia Tech is. And that's where I did my um, first bachelor's degree. And uh, that same day, a storm went through about 10 to 15 miles north of my house, where, you know, where my parents lived, mm -hmm. and it dropped an F4 tornado. So I got back into it because mm -hmm. of this unfortunate event, and um, just so happened that some some of these things were in the right right place at the right time. Um, there was a group at Virginia Tech that was trying to start a meteorology program, and so I got in line with them and. Uh, ended up chasing storms with them for a bunch of years until uh, so I moved out to New Mexico for graduate school. Nice. Um, years later, I ended up um, going and getting a bachelor's in meteorology as well. And uh, this time, I, uh, I'm involved in a bunch of different, uh, I'll, I'll say different meteorology projects with uh, the storm chasing. I take people out. Um, I take high school students out. Uh, the first, Typically, the first week of May, I take five high school students out chasing as part of a science enrichment program that we have at Magdalena. Cool. I also um, normally, last couple of years anyway, I've taken a producer for the um, Today Show and um, also a group that flies drones around storms and collects data. So kind of got into it, just seized opportunities as they showed up. Cool. So what... What do, I mean, I know storm chasers go around and chase tornadoes and take pictures and video, but, I mean, are they actually doing, like, science behind this, too, and taking readings and putting all this in some database to help researchers better understand all this? Or? Uh, some of it, and some of it is, um, uh, it just depends on what, what I'm doing in the particular year. With the group um, that I'm taking with the drones, they, uh, they're, they're known as the Sirens Project, and they have two different, um, two different, farms that they do. Some of it is they do some of the research on their own, and uh, a couple couple engineers that uh, build drones and, and fly them, and they're loaded with sensors, and uh, haven't gotten a whole lot of good data yet, but that's, that's part of the challenge is, um, unlike doing things in a lab where you get to control a lot of your environment, uh, you're kind of stuck with what you're stuck with. Right. Uh, 
when, when you're out chasing. Mm-hmm. And um, a lot of what I do is more uh, teaching forecasting because on the um, – like if you watch the movies or watch, you know, TV, the way that storm chasing is presented is, oh, there's a tornado warning. We'll go drive to it. Mm-hmm. And the way it actually happens is you have to develop a forecast and get there before the warning. Um, I've called in quite a few, at least severe hail, a couple tornadoes, been the first person to call them into the National Weather Service. And so... Basically, you have to have enough working meteorology knowledge to get there ahead of time. Right. Um, let's see. What else was I going to say about that? So depending on what so, – so part of what I do is teach forecasting and what I'm looking at and how to, how to do this with basically um, limited data and uh, how, to, how to make those sorts of decisions. And, and so I know for the high school kids – that's a that's a lot of fun. Uh, some of them have never left. Last year, I think, had one kid that had never left Socorro County, New Mexico. Mm-hmm. And so just going out to Kansas and Oklahoma, that was all new stuff for them. Yeah. And so get, just getting them the, the experience of being out there and teaching some of the um, – some of just the meteorology and the, and the, the dynamics of, of the atmosphere was a lot of fun. And so that's kind of kind of how I do things. That's what I work with with the, um, with the, the drone crew as well, as uh, they're pretty, pretty versed in drones, but, you know, we're still learning meteorology, so I help them with that. And so some of it's science, you know, collect, the hard collecting of data, but a lot of it is the actual education end of it. So what what data do do they collect and what, like what different types of data is it all just like wind speed or, I mean yeah I'm sure there's a lot more than that but like what are they collecting So what we're looking at in particular is um, there we're mostly collecting temperature and pressure data and the reason is and what we're what we're looking at is um, right now if you know if obviously if somebody sees a tornado it gets reported as a uh, you know, and, and they warn an area for it. Um, if they see something on radar that looks like it might be a tornado, the, the National Weather Service will issue a tornado warning. And so what we're trying, what we're looking at is the temperature and pressure data um, in front of storms. The idea being that sometimes there's a really, really perfect-looking thunderstorm that you're wondering, why isn't it producing a tornado right now? Mm-hmm. And then sometimes there'll be a tornado that comes from a storm that doesn't look quite as quite as organized. Mm-hmm. And so by collecting, there, there's a couple different competing theories as to where, how tornadoes form. And so one of the things we're looking at is what does it look like before there's a tornado? Once it's on the ground, that's the that's neat to have that data. But kind of more importantly, why why does one storm produce a tornado and not another one? Mm-hmm. And so the idea is with that that if we if we can start figuring that out, um, we can start reducing the number of uh, I don't want to say false alarms, but um, we can start narrowing down where you're issuing warnings and have them be uh, have them be something that just doesn't get ignored. Yeah, because what's happening right now there. is there's plenty of warning on a lot of cases, but. Um, you know, the warnings aren't being taken seriously because so many times they get issued and maybe they're not, um, maybe, maybe the storm's a good ways away from them. And so, you know, so just just being able to reduce that number of, um, uh, I'll say false alarm, it's not really a false alarm, but being able to pinpoint a little more accurately where a tornado is going to strike is kind of where we're, where we're headed with that. Yeah, the more accurately you, you can predict, the more the more people know that it is a, a real thing to be concerned about, and you won't have people like me going out on the driveway to look for the tornado when the tornado alarms go off. What yeah. is the probability that, like, something happens? Like, I'm assuming, like, you've gone out and not much action takes place. <laughs> so what what are the chances? Yeah. Like, one in four? So it, when I first got into storm chasing, which was in – the early 2000s, um, your average storm chase team uh, was running a tornado in about every nine days on the road. 
and um, and when I say nine days on the road, those could be 500, 600 mile days. Um, it was a lot of driving, and as things have improved, mostly in terms of technology, um, you know. One in six days is pretty good, you know, pretty pretty average, I'd say. Um, and having said that, one year I went out for three days and got three tornadoes, and another year I went out for two weeks and got one. So it's, it varies heavily. Um, but what's improved is being able to get get more data wherever we are when we're out chasing. Uh, in the old days, we <laughs> in the morning, we'd go find the town library and sign up for library cards so we could use their computers. <laughs> and uh, and that was our only – that and the weather radio was all our data. And uh, now we can sit there and have a, have multiple laptops. We didn't even have a laptop the first year I went out chasing. It just – we didn't have one. Yeah. And one cell phone for the six of us. Uh, so now it's like, oh, yeah, we can look up all sorts of stuff now and, you know, have, have close to real-time radar images. We can have uh, – um, we can even do things like uh, which of these roads – is, you know, are any of these roads that we're may use as a escape route, or any of them under construction or not paved, or you know, what what's what's the deal with that? We can look all that up on the road, provided we have you know data where we are. But that's getting better every year. So the odds are the odds are against you if it, if you think it's like a movie where you know you just run from tornado to tornado. That's just that's not the way it happens. It's uh, I think I think last year we did one in five days. Uh, was a tornado day for us, so um, you know, a lot of time on the road. <laughs> yeah, Twister was one of my favorite movies when I was a kid, so that's my <laughs> only point of reference for for all that. That's cool, though. <laughs> I looked forward to that movie so much when I was. Uh, I think it came out when I was about fifteen, Please. and uh, it was tornadoes and and uh, and Van Halen, so I mean, <laughs> couldn't beat that. <laughs> so. Um, so for teenagers who aren't close enough to, to get involved with you, what, how could they get into this on their own or just what resources should they look into? So the, there's a couple things they can do and kind of a good starting point. Um, you know, if you're, if, if you're interested in going into meteorology, um, good starting point is uh, anything math and science you can get a hold of. Um, but then the National Weather Service offers, um, there's a course called Skywarn, and it's hosted at um, all the local uh, National Weather Service offices, and I think there's 88 of them in the country. So depending on where you're located, um, they're the ones that issue the warnings. But a couple, depending on where you are, um, they offer free training courses that um, basically what they call it is uh, Skywarn Spotter course and you go through it and they teach you a fair amount of meteorology you know kind of intro meteorology and the idea is once you've been trained by them um, then if you observe severe weather you can call them and um, report it and then you know having been through their training program that that they're more likely to issue a warning based on what you say uh, why that's important is it's free or why it's why it's a good good thing to do um, you can do it at any age. Uh, my stepson, I think he did his first guy worn course when he was 10. And, um, so, I mean, it's not, uh, not, it, you can do it at pretty much any age. The level of math that you need at that point is not much. They mostly show you visual clues and, and what to look for, um, and what different clouds mean and, and stuff like that. Cool. Uh, so it's a good starting place. And uh, so encourage everybody to get involved with that right away. Um, that's, that's the biggest one. Oh, cool. No, that's awesome to know, especially like free resources and uh, the yeah. age limitations. Is, you know, it's not there. So it's going to really help out our audience for those that are interested in meteorology. So can you, I guess, if we step back and maybe just mm -hmm. talk about like how you ended up where you're at and maybe, you know, as early back as you think is relevant to kind of what led you, uh, you know, just talk about your steps, you know, you know, how you maybe you chose a college or how you chose your degree or what um, yeah. exposure you had when you were younger that encouraged you to go in that direction. 
Sure. Well, um, uh, like I, like I said, with the, the with the storm chasing um, and the meteorology end of things, uh, I I was interested in that from really little, and as, as dumb as it sounds, it was from a TV program, and it it helped that my mother um, was interested in meteorology as well, and uh, she had originally back in the '70s had applied to be in the Air Force as a meteorologist, and uh, they said her vision was not uh, was not up to standard and so she didn't do it but she was always interested in it so she of course encouraged me in that in that path my father is an electrical engineer and worked for the department of defense and so i was always around technology and um you know i remember him building computers back in the 80s and uh that was always we just always were i was always around that sort of thing so um I guess sometime in probably high school, you know, I liked, I knew I liked to, I, I knew I liked weather and uh, became an amateur radio operator when I was about 10. Uh, my father is an amateur radio operator, so he encouraged me in that path. So kind of already headed down the computers and electronics path as well. And sometime in high school, I started doing um, uh, programming and uh, everything was, it was pretty cool. I mean, there was a, you know, at the time, Bill Gates was becoming the richest man in, mm. in uh, the, the world, I think, at the time. And it was like, well, you know, computers were really starting to catch on. And so everybody, well, I wouldn't say everybody, uh, but lots of people wanted to be programmers. And so we had a computer science uh, curriculum at my high school. And so we did, I did that. And then as a senior, the third computer science course we did at a contracting company nearby. And so I actually got to write code for the Navy as a 17-year-old. So That's that cool. was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so that was in Virginia, and I was, you know, looking at different schools and all, and, and my first choice was Virginia Tech. And so I ended up that was, that some of my coworkers went to Virginia Tech, and, um, you know, when the recruiters would come by, they talked highly of Virginia Tech. My father spoke highly of Virginia Tech. Yeah, that's a great he, school. he didn't go there. Um, so that was that was a pretty obvious choice for me. In fact, uh, it was a one time procrastinating paid off because I'd applied to Virginia Tech and then as a backup I applied to University of Virginia and I hadn't written the essays yet and I was waiting because I didn't want to write the essays and really wanted to go to Virginia Tech. When I got that acceptance letter I didn't finish the essays. So <laughs> you know. Um, <laughs> and uh so, and they're big rival schools, so that's a lot of fun. Um, and then, uh, let's see, went through Virginia Tech and uh, started out as an electrical engineer. And about, I'd say my junior year, I took a course on semiconductors. And uh, we, had a semi, we had a semiconductor clean room there at Virginia Tech. And all of the other kids in the class were uh, materials engineers mm -hmm. and working with them. I was like, wow, these guys, they know a lot of stuff. They're very, you know, this is just a neat field that I didn't even know exist. I mean, not many kids hear materials engineering as a, as a, as a major. And yeah. so here I am a junior in college being exposed to this for the first time. And so I ended up switching majors and becoming a materials engineer. Yay. And, uh, that was, that was, uh, yeah, I had great fun with that. And uh, got to do got to do some neat research there. Uh, got into metallurgy, did some metal casting, did some um, uh, I did some ceramics work where we um, my advisor and I were working on a sensor housing for turbines. And so you got to have something that will withstand all this high temperature and pressure. And and so that was a neat project to to be involved with and then, you know, just kind of learning how to do different test methods and, uh, and all that was all part of that experience for me. And, uh, originally I was going to stay at Virginia tech for a PhD and, um, uh, just things, things didn't work out. My, uh, my advisor got sick and, uh, probably April or so of my senior year, uh, it turned out that there wasn't funding for me to stick around. So, my my backup choice, which ended up working out great, was uh, New Mexico Tech. Mm. And so 
I ended up coming out to New Mexico Tech, and I had a lot more opportunities um, in terms of it being a small school and getting to be involved in a lot of different things. And um, I worked on my master's there, and uh, part of the way through, they renovated my labs. It took me a little longer to get a master's. Uh, They uh, worked on my building for about a year and a half, so that hurt. (laughs) But uh, uh, when it was all said and done, I got turned around and ended up being hired by the chemical engineering department while I finished my master's degree and uh, been teaching there ever since. Cool. How did you uh, hear about New Mexico Tech to begin with? I'm curious. So it was um, a couple things came up and it was just kind of coincidental. Um, through the, through this, through the interest in meteorology, um, I used to, I, I would read different, you know, meteorology papers and such as I would run across them. And um, one of the uh, one of the guys that was real well known in storm chasing was a guy named Tim Samaris. And um, unfortunately, he was killed a couple of years ago chasing oh my God. Uh, out in Oklahoma. But uh, really kind of a rare circumstance. And But he actually um, had some cooperation with New Mexico Tech uh, through... Um, he did some lightning research. In fact, he bought, um, before, right before he passed, he bought a high-speed camera off of Emertech to use uh, in some high-speed lightning photography. So mm. um, I'd been reading papers about it. Oh, this New Mexico Tech place is pretty neat because, you know, I knew that Tim Samaris had been doing some work there. And um, when I was working on my senior design project, uh, a couple of the papers I read were from professors at New Mexico Tech. And so when I was, you know, so I applied there. And just a little Socorro history for you. Um, I applied there about two days before the big hail sco- storm that they had in 2004. Yeah, we heard about um, that, too. Yeah, so I, I figured I wouldn't hear from them because, you know, I sent my application in the mail. And I <laughs> sat down and watched the Weather Channel a night or two later, and I was like, Socorro, why is that familiar? I, I, I know that name, I know that town. And, uh, you know, it's like, oh, well, I won't hear from them because they got destroyed by the hailstorm. Mm. And um, so a couple years, you know, about April or so, I got my acceptance letter from them, and I said, oh, okay, well, and I was just about to say that now I'm going to stay at Virginia Tech when all that fell apart. And um, my advisor said, well, you know, if you go to New Mexico Tech, there's a professor there that did her PhD at Virginia Tech, and um, and uh, she's she's very knowledgeable. And it turns out, I had for my senior design uh, work, I had already run across her some of her work, and then so I ended up working for Dr. Hirschfeld out at uh, New Mexico Tech. So <laughs> oh, it's some of these some of these things. It's like they came together. Um, some things looked like they were going to be a bad thing, and then it ended up working out really well. So that's that's how I ended up hearing of New Mexico Tech and, and going out there. So it was like it just kept coming up in different different parts of my life. And so, oh, well, here I am. <laughs> so did you work under Dr. Hirschfeld? I worked for her. I, I love and miss yeah. that woman. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I worked for her uh, for, for a bunch of years there back in um, – uh, I, was, I was there from – 2005 to probably officially 2010, but like I say, a bunch of that was the lab being renovated. So um, I used to run the um, uh, there was the plasma spray system at the uh, you know in Jones. There's the high bay back. Uh, I guess it would be on the west side. Yep, All right. and, I remember uh, that. Yeah, that was all. That was my lab, and that was all my equipment, and. Uh, and that, that facility, there was only about, I think it was us and Stony Brook and like two other universities in the country that had that equipment. Mm-hmm. So, um, so that was, that was what, that was the other draw to it was, uh, that plasma spray equipment only was only at a couple of universities. And when New Mexico Tech was one of them, that was a, uh, that was a good fit. So, so what is plasma spraying? I've never heard of that before. So the idea is if you want to make um, – uh, it's a way to make coatings. And in particular, um, if you want to take something and put like a ceramic coating on it, one way you can do that is with 
this plasma spray system. It takes in, um, you're basically generating a really high temperature plasma. Uh, they're, you know, depending on the how you have your parameters set up, the plasma itself could be up to 20,000 Kelvin. Mm -hmm. And so everything melts in that. So basically you can feed these high temperature ceramic powders into it and it melts in the plasma. But then the way that the plasma gun is designed, it basically blasts all this molten ceramic out. And each of those little, each of those little particles melted and is individually, you know, very hot. But as soon as it, you know, contacts whatever you're coating. So suppose you're taking um, uh, ceramic. I was using, um, uh, I was using a couple different things, but uh, maybe you're spraying some high temperature ceramic on a piece of aluminum. You couldn't heat the aluminum, or you couldn't heat the uh, ceramic in like a you know, a, a furnace and then dump it on the aluminum, it would damage the aluminum. Whereas uh, this, these little particles striking it, um, they don't have enough thermal mass to, to actually heat up the whole piece of aluminum. So what you end up with is you're basically spray painting a high temperature ceramic onto something that would otherwise never be able to be coated this way. Mm. Um, there's other techniques that you could use that they did in that lab where you could do things even like um, put on a, uh, a glove and spray a metal powder onto it. And so, I mean, it's one of the only ways you can, you can come up with this, you can develop this coating. And so um, that's kind of a, I could draw you a picture, but that doesn't help you uh, <laughs> <laughs> right, right this minute. Um, but it's a, a really good way to do high temperature coatings. So what's the point of, of a, a ceramic coating? When Where would that be used? A uh, bunch of the places. Uh, my project was through Los Alamos, and so there's not a whole lot I can say about it. Sure. But uh, w one of the most common uses of these plasma spray coatings is uh, turbines. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically you can coat some of the pieces in, um, in ceramic, and they can withstand the high temperature. And you can have saw, you can have, you know, weaker materials behind it. That's so cool. with a, even just a thin ceramic coating, you can you can keep um, uh, from damaging other other materials. Whereas if you just made it completely out of ceramic, uh, that would be really expensive, and uh, it would also be very brittle. Whereas if you just coat it with ceramic periodically, you can go in and recoat it, and uh, but it'll it'll um, protect the inner components. So. For instance, uh, Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma, I think they serve most of the Air Force for just that purpose. They have big uh, thermal spray booths for doing exactly that. So, you know, you're going through all of these topics, and I think a lot of people would assume that they're all really separate. Like, I don't think people realize how interconnected engineering, <laughs> science, even meteorology is. So can you, like, follow up with that and, you know, like, talk about um, – I've just seen – you know, I worked in academia for a while, and I feel like subjects are so siloed off. Like, you know, you never knew what another department was doing because you didn't have yeah. any involvement in that. But in reality, you know, you guys kind of dealt with the same thing. Like, even nucleation, right, in materials engineering and mm -hmm. meteorology – like even the terminology is very similar. Absolutely, and 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 sometimes it's a matter of terminology, and that's literally the only thing between certain parts of disciplines. But kind of my approach to to engineering and to sciences um, has you know I've always operated on the assumption that all these things are connected somehow, and um, kind of the way I looked at it was with engineering you're solving problems of some sort and you're using some scientific method and, and techniques to, to do so. And so it's kind of funny, you know, other than a friendly rivalry between departments and, and majors, um, it's kind of funny because it's like, uh, you know, for a little while I was working at Intel and it's like, well, what makes the next fastest, uh, computer chip. Well, we got to get heat out of the chip. Well, is that a materials problem? Because we need to be able to transfer heat. 
or is it a mechanical engineering problem, or is it an electrical engineering problem, or is it a computer engineering problem? And it's like, well, chances are there's an approach to solving this through all of them. And so the idea of breaking things into little teeny tiny pieces um, may not be the best approach to actually solving problems. It's like the um, one of the classic things, I, was, I read this when I was an undergrad and it stuck with me. Uh, there was a bunch of teams trying to figure out how to pick tomatoes with robots. You figure a tomato is pretty soft and, um, you know, a little robotic hand has to have real good control to pull the tomato. Mm -hmm. And so these teams went through and, you know, what kind of control algorithm can you use? What kind of materials can you make the hand out of to pick these these things? And at some point, uh, one of the uh, one of the design teams says, "Well, you know, we pick them when they're not as when they're not as ripe. They'll ripen transport, but they're so, they're they're firmer, and we're less likely to damage them." Mm. And that won the, this little competition these these uh, teams of engineers were having. And I don't remember it was MIT or someplace. I can't remember all the specifics, but the point is that. Um, what did they, they ended up using uh, biology and agriculture to solve the problem. And uh, even though it was like an electrical, it was like a mechatronics department, I think, was who was having the contest. And, and so all of these things are related. And so, um, you know, sometimes getting experience from different places uh, will, will help with that. So as, not, as a graduate student, I had uh, about at one point, I had 11 undergrads working for me, and some of them were uh, were from the Navy. I had a, a guy who did plumbing before he went to school. Uh, I had another guy who had committed some crimes and had cleaned mm -hmm. up. And so I had all these various experiences, and every single one of them had ways to solve problems that if you'd just been traditionally trained as I'm going to be a materials engineer and nothing else, mm -hmm. you, would, you would miss that. And so... Um, the important point is to just be able to learn from anything and anyone, and uh, you'll see how some of these things are related. Yeah, I'm really curious, like the the big computer models that you hear about, where the weather forecasts you know come from. Mm -hmm. Is all that you know in mechanical engineering we learn about computational fluid dynamics? You know, is that kind of the same thing that's used just on a really larger scale, or is it some completely different method? Uh, a lot of it is that, and you figure it's, it, it, it's um, it, there's a lot of that, and there's a lot of um, a lot of programming that goes into it, and a lot of um, you know it, it, it's more than just forecasting at that point. Yeah, it's a lot of fluid dynamics, lots of um, like I remember as an undergrad, we always, in in um, in meteorology we would talk about the uh, hydrodynamics and and uh, and all sorts of stuff related to that and what happens when you increase the humidity and, and, uh, and so on. And so the real problem and what the, um, one of the hardest things with the models is the lack of data that we can put into them. And so you go and develop a computer model, and that's great, um, but then the idea is you constantly are updating it with current you know, current conditions or conditions within the last couple hours. Yeah. And so weather balloon data, um, aircraft data, stuff like that gets fed into it. And the biggest thing is um, it's, a really big, it's a really big country and it's a really big earth, mm -hmm. and there's only a few little balloons we put up and a uh, few aircraft, you know, in the grand scheme of things. Mm -hmm. And they give you a snapshot of what was happening at that time and place and you hope you can put that in and have it make, you know, make sense for the model. In fact, there's been discussions um, amongst my uh, couple of my chasers that uh, are real involved with. Um, I got one guy that's real involved with the the models there, and um, a lot of them come from uh, UCAR in Boulder, Colorado. And he was saying that one of the problems they're having right now is there's not as many <coughs> um, there's not as many aircraft up, and so they're missing model data and that's that's affecting them so some of it is we understand a little bit about the fluid dynamics not as much as we'd like um 
and then also just having limited data to correct it to, to alter it for making a prediction ahead of time. Right. And so it is it is fluid dynamics, but uh, uh, kind of a really big unbounded system. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, yeah, I'm sure you could make a really detailed model, but it'd probably take like a few weeks to run, and, and you don't have a few weeks to run a, a model when you need to know the forecast for tomorrow. <laughs> it's kind of right. So. Well, and there's a big deal. One of the models is called uh, H Triple R, and uh, what's funny about it, and I forget what the H and the Triple R stand for, but uh, they have a model output every every hour from that one. Mm -hmm. And what's funny about that is, um, you know, it's it's pretty good for what's going to happen in the next couple hours. You can't see anything small scale like a tornado, mm -hmm. but you can look and say, yeah, okay, it's going to be cloudy skies, you know, in the state uh, or in the county, maybe. Uh, is it going to, you know, those sorts of things. But um, what happens is uh, some of these things all governed by uh, high-order differential equations and such, it ends up that they call it the uh, uh, fantasy caster later on because if you look at it for, you know, a couple days out, it's a joke. It doesn't, you know, it, it, can't, it can't handle that far of a far out. Um, and so sometimes you'll see things and, you're looking around on Facebook, somebody will use that, and they'll say, oh, look, we're going to get six feet of snow on uh, Tuesday starting at 7 a.m. And it's like, no, no, that's mm. <laughs> too far out. You know, no, I don't care. It's got a pretty graphic. It isn't right. <laughs> so with that, like, you know, you watch, well, like, I, I'm, you know, I'm pretty ignorant when it comes to weather, but I watch the weather, you know, and the weatherman will say something, and I'm like, okay, yeah. You know, I may or may not believe him especially in the mm -hmm. Texas panhandle, like, you know, it could oh, snow sure. this morning and then all of a sudden we're, we're in flip flops by the afternoon. Yep. <laughs> um, so like are I know that meteorology involves a bunch of statistics. Are, is that getting better? Like, is the probability getting closer to really what it is like using the technology or using the, I don't know, mathematics that hadn't been discovered. Like, is it getting better as far as predictions are concerned? I would say I would say so, and um, uh, I mean part of the struggle we have, you know, and, and New Mexico is a little bit in this boat, but definitely the plains. Uh, of course, I'm in the Texas Panhandle pretty frequently with the chasing, but um, one of the things that happens is we're just so far from any body of water that governs our temperature uh, that it's it's a little harder to, to deal with that. And like you like you say, you have these scenarios. You guys had snow a couple days ago. Um, we did, we had a dusting here in, in where I am in New Mexico, but, um, and it may be good weather now, but it's, uh, they have been improving and I, you know, like I say, I've seen it in terms of how far out, um, just discussion amongst other chasers. We'll, we'll sit there and used to be in the old days, it was a three day standby. We would joke about like one of the, um, the Storm Prediction Center has a prediction out to eight days, but you didn't start taking anything seriously till it was about three days out. And then it was like, okay, maybe, you know, day three is looking good, so we may want to just make sure we got our bags packed and ready to go. And, um, you know, now you can start looking at things like, well, what are they looking at at day six and day seven out here and day eight? What is, uh, what are, what are they hoping, or, uh, you know, what do they, what do they think their models are going to, going to show that far out and so the models are getting better um they're retiring models that weren't that were becoming obsolete and so the kind of the two fronts that you're you're getting is farther predictions farther out and smaller scale so um you know when i first started chasing and oh actually when i first started paying attention to weather um they would talk about uh well okay so i'll back up here in mechanical engineering, you deal with uh, finite element analysis and uh, finite different analysis, difference analysis right. for determining stresses and heat and heat flow and all that, where you basically have a grid and you look at uh, points next to it and determine how that's going to change over time. And that was that's basically how a lot of the weather models come together as well. Um, and what's been happening is as computer power has been able to increase, we've been able to put more of those points on the map. Mm -hmm. And so you're getting to be able to see smaller scale features 
that years ago were, you know, invisible. Some of the satellite data that we have now, um, you know, you look at a satellite image, you know, go look up uh, Hurricane Andrew 92 and what the satellite images look like then and now look at them, you know, for just a regular weather event today or just, you know, what, you know, do I have clouds overhead? Can I look at it, you know, look at the satellite image today and it's a lot better. Hmm. And so all of that is data that's being fed into these models. Uh, the satellites uh, now are reporting, you know, it's not just visible and infrared anymore and water vapor used to be the three that you could count on. Now you can look at things like uh, there's there's different spectra for um, how uh, how plants are behaving. So um, you can see if they're they're in a drought or whether they're not. So that tells you a lot about the land conditions, how much moisture is there um, for things like fire predictions, for things like um, you know crop like agricultural purposes. That's big. Um, I'm trying to think what else is uh, what else has been big developments. Uh, radar imagery. Used to be you had uh, you had uh, just a um, re re uh, reflectivity, and now and and maybe velocity data. Now there's all sorts of other metrics that are in there, and you can determine things like uh, are the droplets spherical, and it's called a correlation coefficient. What that means is they're hail versus if they're uh, um, if they're not, if you know that one dimension comes back a lot longer than another, it can be all sorts of things. Especially if you're considering whether or not there's a tornado on the ground, um, things like trees and branches and and building stuff uh, is is not typically spherical, and so that's one of the tools that's available now that wasn't available, uh, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. So yeah, all of this stuff is improving. Um, and so, you know, it's still a joke that meteorology is great because you can be wrong 50% of the time, <laughs> but it's really what happens is, um, uh, what everybody wants to know is, is it going to rain on my barbecue at six o'clock this evening mm -hmm. in my backyard? Uh, and no, that, that isn't around. Can I say it's going to rain sometime in the next two hours in your county? Well, maybe, uh, that, that's getting, uh, that's getting a little better scale, and, and we're getting better about it, but it's it's just so much computing power to be able to take all this data in, and um, and there's still the challenge of getting enough data. I bet at some point Google Earth is going to, like, show action, like the clouds. <laughs> and the... <laughs> so you can Well, tell. and there's, there, there's a lot of that going on right now with, um, like, ArcGIS, uh, where you can – not so much Google Earth data, but you can uh, you can overlay all sorts of stuff with that. And uh, so I know um, uh, I know here in New Mexico, when they started using ArcGIS type data, uh, rather than dividing things by counties, which are all political boundaries, they started dividing things by um, uh, hydro uh, hydrology zones. You know where so so. Um, you know, we draw county lines on a map just because we put them there. That's just where we decided. Some treaty decided it or whatever. Mm -hmm. And instead, they started looking at things like, well, you know, this area here is all one big valley that all drains into one arroyo. Well, we should look at that as a separate meteorolog meteorological entity versus, like, you know, Torrance County or whatever. Yeah. And so... That, those types of improvements coming about because of uh, improvements in, and I mean, Google Earth is going to play a part of it, and so are, so is, um, I can't think of the four-letter acronym, E-something that does ArcGIS is going to be part of it, and um, yeah, all that's improving. <laughs> so, I guess kind of segueing to, like, are the, you know, the whole, whole purpose of this show is kind of to try to connect students to the other side like there's this big disconnect between like most students that you know tend to go into engineering they're like well you know I like math and mm -hmm. to me that's such a I don't want to sound you know harsh but it's kind of a weak connection yeah. 
Oh, it absolutely is. And yeah. so how, you know, what is the best way for students to kind of make that connection between, you know, uh, one of the big things that we're really focusing on is not only that transition, but also that they find something really meaningful. Sure. And so how, well, you know, what advice would you give to students to, to make that jump, you know, and where they can kind of land in a position that they're really happy with? So, so it's a couple. There's a couple parts to that, and it's a lot to unpack. Because there's a lot of um, thoughts around engineers. Uh, you know, when I was growing up, I always heard, "Well, if you liked building things with Legos, you're going to be a you, you should go look at engineering. If you like math, you should be you should look at engineering. If you like computers, you should look at engineering." And um, I, I didn't really. I mean, it, they all kind of served a purpose. The computers were a means to an end for me, and. The Legos, I, I tended to, I was more of the type that would take things apart and, some, you know, most of the time not get it back together. So um, where, but what um, things to look at are not so much um, uh, what subjects in school you like, such as I like math or I like science class, um, but more like what kinds of problems get stuck in your head. You may not even like them, but what, what are the problems that you hear? You run across, you know, you really, if it's mathematical, is it the type of problem that you, you are working on it and you give up for a little while and the next morning you're in the shower and you're like, wait, I know something else I can try. Um, those are the types of problems that, that I would say point you more into one of these STEM careers. Plenty of people think about this in terms of, um, you know, dynamics with people and like, well, what would I say to this person or whatever? And so in the STEM field, you think maybe in terms of how can I solve this problem? Plenty of these things aren't, you know, a lot of people like to build something and have it work the first time and that rarely happens. So it's more about being able to come back to a problem and, and deal with it and think of new ways to approach it. And if you find yourself doing that, then some of these STEM fields are, are, um, are probably a good fit. And things like um, that, that's, that's, probably the, that's probably the biggest one. And, yeah, yeah, I'll say that. No, I think that's beautifully said. I think people don't understand every single company is trying to solve a problem. And if you align yeah. yourself with, with that company's, you know, goal set – the chances of you really enjoying your work are, I mean, it, the statistically increased. Absolutely. Yeah, or and even I, just find a company that aligns with what you're passionate about, the problem you're passionate about solving. Yeah, and and then there's things like, um, besides just in in companies, the the other way to think of this is that there's always problems, and as long as there's problems, there's room for an engineer <laughs> and good... so it's it's funny because um and i recently read unfortunately it was misquoted but there was apparently somebody they worked at a patent office in the 1800s that said you know well why would i continue working there everything's been invented and uh you know before refrigeration before uh radio television uh computers internet everything that's come about in the last hundred and uh however many years and so, unfortunately, it was a great story, but it wasn't true. There, there wasn't this actual quote from this patent office attorney, uh, patent office clerk. But, um, but the point is, even if you don't have, like, a, you know, even if you're not thinking, I'm going to invent the next internet, the next flight, the next whatever, there are so many little processes and so many little improvements, making things safer, faster, cheaper, better. Uh, out there that, um, you know, d always be looking for those opportunities. So um, that's kind of what happened. Kind of what happened with me in electrical engineering was the um, the computer programming market was going, going down a little bit at the time because everybody wanted to do it. But then the semiconductor market was big. So I switched into the semiconductor market and, uh, and that one goes up and down and, um, and so always be looking for that next opportunity and that next next piece. And so, um, you know, some of this stuff, as far as companies go, sometimes you'll work for 
sometimes your desk won't move. It'll be in the same place for four years, but you'll have worked for three companies. It just that stuff changes, and to just always be looking for the next next opportunity and the next place where you can, uh, you know, make the next step. And, you know, like I say, make something safer, make something faster, make something cheaper, better, more efficient, uh, more energy efficient, whatever, whatever's out there. There's, there's lots of those little pieces that you can solve. And sometimes they're, they end up being big pieces. Um, uh, I met the guy who discovered how or developed a way to um, measure the thermal conductivity of soup. <laughs> and you think, so what? Like, what does that mean? Well, he was a consultant, and he consulted for Campbell's in the 30s, and uh, that's the reason you know what Campbell's is and not everybody else mm. uh, that was around in the 30s mm. because um, they had problems being able to heat a big vat of soup without understanding how, the, how it conducted heat. And uh, so you had to make lots of little batches or one big batch with a lot of waste. And so even though it looked like a little problem and, like, isn't that funny or isn't that cute? Like, you know, oh, thermal conductivity of soup. Well, it made a big difference for Campbell. So, um, yeah. so sometimes even the little things that you think aren't, aren't that important end up being a game changer. Very cool. All right, Seth. Um, I think that's all the questions I had in mind. Amanda, do you have anything? No, you, you've been great, Seth. We really appreciate you coming on our show. So Yeah, no problem. Um, excellent. Well, Seth, again, thank you. Uh, I think we got some really good insight here, and we'll get this posted up pretty quick. Um, so I think that's all for today. We really appreciate your time, Seth. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. This podcast is sponsored by Blue Barrel Scientific, a curriculum company that helps homeschoolers discover their career field one experiment at a time.